Thank you for the invitation to come over and see you again. And it's always a pleasure to bring God's word. Thank you, Andrew, for leading um, for me tonight. That really helps me. Um, I want to look at this. We're working through Isaiah at, uh, I nearly said at Hartley Paul, at Haworth. And um, so uh, this, as you said, is just such a great passage, isn't it? Just amazing words. So many of the individual verses, um, you know, familiar to us and of great help to us. Um, but I've always found, I mean, since, since my training uh, 30 years ago, that there is great benefit in looking at sort of longer sections and working out how they fit together. So those very familiar verses that we know so well, trying to work out what's the point of them, where, where do they sort of fit in the text, and how do they fit together. So that's why um, 12 to 31, rather than just individual verses. But let me just start by reading you one of the verses here. Um, so this is verse 27. Isaiah 40, verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? I wonder if you've ever felt like that. You know, had moments when you thought, I wonder if God really does see what I'm going through. Or does he really care about what I'm going through? Is he there? What, why has he decided, if he is there, and he is sovereign, why has he decided to send me through this particular thing, this particular hardship? Why, why didn't he make another path for me? Because he could. I mean, if God is, and I do believe he is, sovereignly in control of all things, why did he choose this path? Well, it's to that question that I think all of these verses in Isaiah 40 are addressed. It's almost like a court case where God calls us to weigh up the evidence about himself, to consider great themes, great ideas about himself. Is he impotent or unwise like the other gods of the nations around them? Do you remember J.B. Phillips wrote a book, Your God is Too Small? This was quite a long time ago. Um, and he roughly split the book in half with destructive ideas about God and constructive ideas about God. And I think in some ways this is a bit like this chapter. It's just, what do you really think about me? What's so damaging about what you think about me? And what am I really like? The temptation for Judah, um, the people of God here, is to forget who God really is. Uh, as they face the prospect of a long and hard captivity in Babylon, something like 70 years, 60 to 70 years, uh, they're left asking if God is really in control and does he really care? Well, the marvellous answer to that, of course, is yes, he is in control and yes, he really does care. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll look at this uh, briefly under five uh, headings uh, and move through the material and try and tackle that question of who is God and how do I view him? So first of all then, 12 to 14, one creator. The question that God raises here in verse 12 is, who is big enough to have done the things that I've done? So verse 12 itself, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who could do that? Who's able to do such a thing? This is not measured in terms of just writing it down. I saw a really interesting uh, graphic the other day of how much water there is uh, on our planet. And they've got a, a globe, and then they've got the amount of water. And it was actually quite a bit smaller. This is not that. It's not like a scientific measurement of how much uh, water is in the world. It's who could put it in the palm of their hand. Now, I know it's a metaphor. God the Father doesn't have a body like we do because he's spirit. But it's just saying, how immense am I? What human being could ever do such a thing? What animal could do such a thing? But I, the immense almighty God, can do that. But not only that, who has helped God to understand to how to make the world and run it? I, mean, he, I presume he didn't look it up on Google. Uh, how do I construct a world? Well, what are the next steps? Or ask AI, chat GPT. I'm not quite sure on the next bit. What do I do? Who, who would do such a thing for God? Who would advise him? Who has enough understanding to know how everything works down to the lowest level, beyond the atomic, subatomic, quantum, and then all the rest that we haven't even imagined yet? 
Who did God go to and ask what to do? Well, no one. There was no one who had understanding or wisdom and who could instruct God. No one apprenticed him or trained him. In the Babylonian uh, myth of creation, Marduk, their god, had to consult Ea, the all-wise, to ask how to make the world. Their creation god needed advice. But the real god is not so limited. He doesn't need to ask. There's no one wiser or mightier than he is. So the answer to this first question is no one is powerful or wise enough. God alone is the creator. Only he is big enough to have made this immense universe. And only he is wise enough to instruct it in all of its complexity and beauty. It is possible that we've made God so much in our image. I'm talking about as Christians. We make him so much in our image that we forget that he's not like us at all. In certain regards, he is so far beyond us that it is incomprehensible how great he is. But to use sort of theological terms, uh, omniscient, omnipotent, these words are trying to describe something that is essentially indescribable. God is vast. I don't mean spatially vast. He is everywhere all at once. I get that. That's the omnipresent word. But he just is big. He's just big. Our God is a great big God. You know the, the children's song? I don't know if you ever do that here. It's very simple, the language, isn't it? Our God is a great big God. And I think we even sang it this morning in the children's song. And he holds us in his hand. Sort of a bit reminiscent of the Isaiah 40 words, isn't it? He's big. There's something very comforting about the fact that our God is big. I love watching nature programs. Uh, my grandparents, who are now in heaven, uh, used to watch um, David Attenborough um, uh, programs all the time. And what they used to do is turn off the volume so they couldn't hear his voice and put on classical music in the background so they didn't have to be annoyed by his assumptions about all sorts of things. I thought that was pretty wise, really. Um, but... but I love nature programs because the, the immensity of the creation and the beauty of the creation and the complexity of the creation shout out loud, don't they, that the, the God who made me is awesome. He is absolutely awesome. I had to stop on the road over, on the way over and take a picture because I don't know what it's been like here, but in, in Howarth it's been absolutely pouring down this morning. And then suddenly as I was coming over the top, the, the clouds opened, the sun came out, and I thought, God, you are amazing. You are absolutely amazing in what you make. And then to emphasize that, God turns to the nations, to you and me, to our supposed greatness. And what does he say about us in 15 to 17? Well, he says, secondly, the nations are nothing. Behold, the nations are like a drop in a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Compared to him and his greatness, they are just a drop in the bucket. And this is coming from the God who holds the oceans in his hands. And he's saying, all of you, you're just a, you're just a drop in a bucket. We're like a bit of dust on the scales that perhaps... If you were trying to be really accurate, you'd just wipe that bit of dust off because it might just change it by a milligram or something. Well, we're just that. That's, that's the sum totality of uh, human strength and power. He's not saying he doesn't love the world. I was preaching on John 3.16 this morning. God loves the world, as in he loves people. But the nations, in all their great power, they're just nothing. They're just like dust. We've just invested... Um, haven't we a load more money in the Royal Navy? Of course, I'm interested in that because one of my sons is in the Navy. And I've been, I went on the um, HMS Prince of Wales recently, and it is vast. I mean, it is big, and it is powerful. I mean, it's just extraordinary. But it's nothing. You know, compared to God, it's nothing. All of that might and all of that power amounts to dust on the scale. And does God need the attention and sacrifice of people? Well, verse 16 addresses that in terms of our, I don't know what you would describe it as. I mean, in certain computer games, they talk, this is ridiculous, but they talk about manna as if it was some sort of fuel to fuel the gods. Is God, does he need our sacrifices to keep him going, to sort of 
pep him up and make him feel great. Well, God says this in verse 16, Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor its beasts enough for a burnt offering. What sacrifice would be enough to honor him? Uh, well, not all the wood in the mighty Lebanon. That's why it talks about Lebanon, because it was famous for its forests. That's where they got their cedars and oaks from. So not even all of the wood in that vast country with all of those um, forests. It's not enough. And all the animals, that wouldn't be enough. There's only one sacrifice that God is satisfied with, isn't there? All the sacrifices of the Old Testament were pointing forward to one sacrifice that was of significance, that would satisfy the eternal, almighty God. And it was the sacrifice of his son, the eternal, almighty son. He sacrifices himself. He lays down his life and satisfaction is made. So the talk of, you know, how much can we do to please God and satisfy him, well, it's just nonsense, isn't it? And I'm afraid that we are not as mighty and as great as we think we are. In terms of strength, wisdom, power, understanding, compared to God, we are insignificant. All the nations are as nothing before him. They're accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. Israel fell. That was in their recent history. Syria fell. Assyria fell. Even in time, the mighty Babylon would fall. And then you go through history. I, I've been reading... Um, uh, a book about Rome recently Pax and you think how mighty the Roman Empire was it was extraordinary and it fell and then you think I know it's not very PC to say this but you think how great the British Empire was it was vast the British Empire and that's not the same today uh, and we think about the great powers of our world and we need to remind ourselves that they too gone one day. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well hang on a minute, this is meant to be comforting and encouraging. What on earth is comforting and encouraging about this? Um, doesn't the chapter, it does start with the words comfort my people, why are we being told all of this? Well I think perspective is a powerful thing, it really helps. I think middle of the night when it's dark and you wake up and you're thinking about all those bad things, Perspective is one of the most important things to gain. It's hard to get perspective in the night, but to, as David did, rest on his bed and think about God and think about this chapter is a particularly good one, how amazingly powerful and sovereign and great he is. That's good medicine. That's really good medicine. So God is the only creator. He's greater than the nations. How else does he describe himself? Well, he's... The one God. Who should we compare God to? If no man or nation is powerful enough, what about the other so-called gods of the day? Well, let's talk about your idols, says God. And this would be very relevant for the people of Judah in captivity in Babylon with all those false gods around them. And the temptation to give in and become like the Babylonians to sort of assimilate themselves. I want you to imagine that uh, there's a... Uh, a man or woman of Judah walking down one of the streets in Babylon and they come across a local idol wholesaler and there's an advert up outside this wholesaler and it's called Deities and Demigods Limited. Uh, images small and large for all the family designed and built to meet your every budget. From the top of the range model we'll build you a fine cast idol overlaid with 24 karat gold even with silver chains to fasten it to the ground so that when the strong gusts of wind come along, you won't have the embarrassment of your god falling over in your garden. Or for those on a tighter budget, there is the economy model, carefully selected from um, rot-free wood. It's skillfully crafted into the god of your choosing and will send you one of our top craftsmen to your house to set up your idol so it will be guaranteed not to fall over either. God uses humour. I mean, isn't that surprising? I know this is Isaiah writing, but this is God speaking about what he's like through Isaiah. And he uses humor. He pokes fun at the stupidity of our idolatry. The point here is, is this how you think about God? Is this what you think he's like? Is he a little extra something in your life that, well, it's not really very substantial. He's useful at certain points, but he's not the main thing. He's just a little thing. Just a little pole in your garden carved in a certain way. 
is God like the other gods of the world, the idols? Well, the answer is no. And Isaiah lays it out in verse 21. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits upon the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. Don't we know? Haven't we realized what God is really like? That he is in control, and he has been from the beginning? He sits above the earth, he rules. He is so incomprehensibly great that the entire universe is just a tent to him. Just like a temporary thing you set up and then you have a week away on holiday maybe, it's just a tent. That's the universe, that's everything. He's not like the petty inventions of human beings. He isn't just the god of the sun or the god of the crops or the god of fertility. He isn't some stupid carving that a craftsman has knocked together that falls over when it gets windy. He is the God, the only God, who made us, not the other way around. And he looks down at us, and we are like little grasshoppers, which moves us to the fourth point. The rulers are nothing. Great princes sit on their thrones, and rulers govern their empires, but God still brings them to nothing. Verse 23, he brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem begun to take root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. No sooner have you started to live and breathe, to rule and govern, than God blows on them and they're gone. Judah would see some mighty rulers in their time in captivity. Some of these names would be very familiar to you. Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, Cyrus, powerful men, really powerful men in worldly terms. But in the end, they were only men, and it was God who was always in control. Remember what happened to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4. He strolls around on top of the roof of his palace, patting himself on the back, metaphorically, and saying, what a good boy I am. Look how powerful I am. Look at this, which I have built by my mighty power. And what does God do? Well, he strikes him down with an illness that makes him eat grass like a cow and grow hair like an animal. Daniel 4, 28, all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar 12 months later as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. He said, is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Just think, I, I often think about that. And um, the stupid things that have come out of my mouth. And sometimes you catch yourself afterwards saying something. You think, what a wally I was to say that. And you think about the regret that he would have felt. And pretty quickly after saying this, what arrogance, what stupid arrogance to say that. How could I have been such a fool? The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar, your royal Authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live in the, with the wild animals. You'll eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. In other words, to take up the words of Isaiah 40, God determines how long the mighty will live and the extent of their kingdoms. And it is exactly the same today. Exactly the same today. It's no different. God determines how long the rulers live and how long they serve and the extent of their reign. He determines that. We have our mighty rulers and kings, our presidents, our prime ministers, our generals, but they're all in God's hands. They're all under his rule. In his sight, they're as small as grasshoppers. He raises them up. He brings them down. They take root. They wither. Then God summarizes uh, this by asking a number of questions from 25 onwards. Who is his equal? No one. Who can we compare him to? No one. Who has put the stars in the sky and placed them there perfectly? Answer, God and God alone. No human was involved in that. 
or ever will be. God does that. Yeah, this is, I, I have a, um, a quite a nice telescope at home, a reflecting telescope, uh, which occasionally I'll get out and take outside. And here's my um, thoughts on that. The night sky can preach a more eloquent sermon than I can by a long way. And going out at night, even with the naked eye, um, you can see somewhere between 2,000 and 5,000 stars with the naked eye. If you've got really good eyes, 5,000 stars, that's a lot of stars, isn't it? But it's not really. Let me give you a few facts and figures. Um, our sun is so vastly massive, you could fit our planet inside the sun 1.3 million times. That's big. That's really big. Did you know that there are up to, it's estimated, 400 billion stars in our galaxy, in the Milky Way? Just in the Milky Way, in the bit of space that we live in. 400 million suns. Our galaxy, if you could travel at the speed of light, it's 120,000 light years across. A light year is the amount of distance you travel in a year if you're traveling at the speed of light. Light travels at 186,000 miles per second. So a light year is about 6 trillion miles. There are estimated to be, and that's just our galaxy, the Milky Way. It's not a particularly big one terms, astronomical terms, but there it is, pretty massive. There are estimated to be something like 200 billion galaxies in the known universe. Now, they're too big to take in. I'm not expecting you to think, well, that's amazing, because it, you just can't get your head around it, can you? I mean, what, they're just numbers. They're lots of zeros, but it's an attempt for my mind at least, to say that this is much bigger than Halifax or Howarth. <laughs> We're just little, little dots, just little dots on a big planet. It's a little planet next to a big sun, which is only one in, whatever I said it was, 200 billion stars in, in our galaxy, which is part of, 400 billion stars in our galaxy, which is part of a universe which we reckon we've got 200 billion of those galaxies. I mean, it's just mind-blowing, isn't it? Absolutely mind-blowing. And the point of telling you all that is to say, God made that, you didn't. He is amazing. And he knows it all. Every single detail of every single sun with every single planet around those suns. Not all of them have got them, but we've discovered a few now. God made that and designed it in all of its beauty. The temptation to think that God doesn't see and can't or won't help is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous to think that God can't see. And now we get to that tremendous question of verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Why do you keep saying these things, O Jacob? Now the tense of the Hebrew there, apparently, is continuous. Why do you keep saying this? Why do you keep saying, God doesn't see me, he doesn't understand leads us, fifthly, to the final conclusion, the great conclusion, this God is for us. The problem is that God is thought of as being blind in some way to particular griefs of his people, and for some reason he won't or can't help them. Why should they suffer captivity in Babylon? Why doesn't he save them? Doesn't he hear? Doesn't he care? And like I said at the beginning, how many of us have felt like that at one time or another? Doesn't God see what I'm going through? Why is my way hidden from the Lord? I feel so alone. And if he does, why doesn't he act? Why won't he answer my prayer? Well, part of the solution is to this lies firstly in our view of God and secondly in our personal direct experience of him. We've just spent the last, however long, 25 minutes uh, remembering how great God is He's told us and has revealed himself right from the very beginning. Uh, Derek Kidner, some of you may have come across him, a great Bible teacher, um, has a brilliant phrase to sum up this dilemma. We look at the evidence and we say, he is too great to hear. Whereas we should look at the evidence and say, he is too great to fail. 
Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He is the everlasting God. Another God. In other words, he doesn't change. He is still the same mighty creator he was when he formed the universe. He doesn't grow tired. He doesn't have a rest or a holiday. He doesn't grow weary and want to give up. Not like that in any way. That's not God. And not only is his power vastly transcendent to ours, but his wisdom is too. Um, we see some of the facts, but he sees everything. Absolutely everything. We see immediate circumstances. He sees the beginning from the end. And what he does is always the very best, the optimal in the true sense of the word. The very best is what he chooses always. And part of his nature is to impart strength to those who need it. And that is part of who he is. He shares his resources with us. He gives, verse 29, he gives power to the faint and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Well, that's the theology of it. God does hear and he does help because of who he is. But our experience of that is incredibly important. Even youths fail and become weary and young men shall fall exhausted. Even the strongest and fittest of young men get tired and fall. Circumstances overcome, pressures bring us down. So the best that man has to offer still fails, unlike our God who never tires and never stumbles. For the man or woman who trusts in God, it is a different story. Different translations use different words. Here in verse 31, some say, uh, blessed those who wait, and some say, blessed those who hope in the Lord. Actually, if you combine the two, then you come very close to the original meaning, I think. The word actually means patient trust. It's a good encouragement for us this afternoon, isn't it? To patiently trust in the Lord, to wait and to hope on him. Not ranting and raving about the situation we're in, not despairing about the situation, but rather having a quiet, persistent confidence in God. And those who do find divine stores of strength imparted, God himself will give them strength to endure. The chapter ends on a marvellous note. God is great and mighty in this. God is for us, for his people. He does see, he does hear. He is well able to deal with all the situations that we find ourselves in. It's hard to patiently wait for the Lord, isn't it? If you've ever had that experience where you've prayed about something, been worried about something. Well, this is Isaiah speaking under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, speaking God's words to us this afternoon. Patiently wait. Well, let's sing our last song together, shall we? Um, this is based around Psalm 40, uh, who has held the oceans in his hands. So let's stand and let's sing.